Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program that's designed to take you through the Bible. Now, we're doing that today. We're in the book of Psalms, which is basically a book of music. I love this book. Uh, it's 150 songs, and it's great, all about different things at different times, and what we're to do. Praise the Lord. That's what it tells us to do. Well, Corey is here to tell us something about that. Corey, what's up? Today, I'm going to be focusing in on some of the history of this book of Psalms. All right, that is interesting, and the history should be fascinating as well. So what did you study today? Well, today we're just going to have a discussion on Psalm 19. All right, Psalm 19. This mm -hmm. is a great psalm. The heavens declare what? We'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, Ryan, what's up? And today in Mysteries of the Bible, I'm continuing our study of Messianic prophecies within the book of Psalms. All right, it is time to study the Bible, so let's get our Bible guide and our Bible and get ready and let's study. Now, because the book of Psalms is a very literary book, it is full of poetry and uh, ancient music lyrics, we don't often associate history with this type of writing and this type of literature. However, the book of Psalms does have a really interesting and diverse history and authorship to it. So today, you and I are going to focus on that. The English title for the Biblical Book of Psalms comes from the Greek title meaning Songs of Praise. This simply sweet title sums up very well the book's internal contents made up of various worship songs representing vast circumstances in human life. About one-third of these praises are written in a prayer format. Not all of the Bible's 150 psalms have claimed authors. 48 of them are anonymous. Of the remaining 102, King David's name is connected to about half of them. Biblically, this falls right into line with what we know about David. In 2 Samuel 23, he is called the favorite singer or psalmist of Israel. And before he was king, he was a musician in Saul's royal court. The psalms ascribed to him reflect the life experiences he is known to have had as a shepherd, a military man, and king. Of the remaining psalms, 12 of them are ascribed to Asaph. Asaph was one of David's chief musicians, but the Bible also tells us that after his life, a group of musicians took on his name as well, which explains why one psalm named after him appears to be from the time after the Babylonian exile, hundreds of years after Asaph's life. Ten psalms are claimed by the sons of Korah, a group of temple singers mentioned in 2 Chronicles 20. Two psalms are ascribed to King Solomon, one to Heman, the son of Korah, a temple singer during the reigns of David and Solomon. He is called a seer, one who prophesied using musical instruments. One psalm is credited to Ethan, a man also mentioned as a temple singer. And surprisingly, one psalm is ascribed to Moses. With these authors in mind, it would have taken about 1,000 years for the Book of Psalms to have been completed, and it's often believed that the final editor and compiler was Ezra. Traditionally, it has been noted that Psalms is arranged into five different sections or books, believed by many to mirror the first five books of the Bible. We don't often consider how the book of Psalms was collected, do we? Uh, most of us, as we're reading through the Psalms, we recognize that Psalms were not written just by King David. He's definitely um, the most talked about author of the book of Psalms, and he's given credit the most uh, for the most songs, even within uh, the book of Psalms itself. Uh, but there are um, ascriptions and superscriptions given to other uh, individuals writing these psalms. So most of us are aware that David did not write all the psalms. So uh, ha this process of collection is one that should be in our minds because I think it's really interesting how there really is this a vast area of time between, most of it happening between the life of King David and the exiles in Babylon. There are a few post 
e exile um, psalms that were written. And, and we know that because it refers to the exiled people of Israel and Judah in those psalms. Uh, so we have a period of uh, just over 500 years between David and the exile that these psalms are being collected and put together. Now, there is even a psalm claimed to have been written by Moses. Of course, there's debate over, you know, did Moses actually write this or was this a, a, a psalm that was written in memory or in memoriam and honor of Moses? A lot of people have different views on that, but it is possible that Moses wrote uh, extending this time period even further. The heavens declare the glory of God is how Psalm 19 begins its song. The sky is a tapestry of beautiful stories from the Bible. The Mazoreth tells the story of redemption of God embedded in the works of human history. Most of the world never truly sees this critical story. The late Dr. William Leask wrote in part, quote, is it not true that to the church is given holy honor of dispelling night, bringing back the human race to heaven by kindling everywhere the gospel light. Is it not true? The sky is majestically beautiful with the message of God. We need to remember that. When we work through Psalm 19, we begin to understand the way God does this. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Psalm 19. You know, it's interesting, the Mazoreth is the sky, and that's a Hebrew word that explains that the sky is filled with constellations. Before there was a corruption of that, and a seeking after spirits for that. There was a story that is told, and that's something that we don't have time to go into, but it's interesting. Psalm 19 deals with that, and that's one of the chapters we're going to cover today. Get your Bible guide out and your Bible so we can study this together. I think you'll find it very interesting. If you don't have the Bible guide, you can write to us at the U.S. address or the Canadian address, or you can write to us, of course, at the British address, or you can go to www. 
BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and click on Donate. We'll be happy to send you a guide when you make that donation. Thank you so much for that. Now, as we look at works of faith, we have something planned for you. And the only way to look at this is to say, the heavens declare. Declare what? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? The heavens declare. We're going to find that out. We read Psalm 19 to 23. Psalm 19 is fascinating, by the way. So that's keeping up through the Bible. We're looking at Psalm 19, verses 1 to 14. And as we look at this, we need to consider what is God saying and what's God doing here? Now, this is music. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to hear the music and to understand what you're saying in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 2, say it this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. That, that, that's a strong statement in itself. And the firmament show his handiwork. Again, another strong statement. That's uh, all on the, the, the Bible says it's all on the sky. It says, day unto day utters speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge, reveals knowledge. Now listen carefully, beloved. The Lord is never without wisdom and understanding about his message of the good news gospel of Jesus Christ. The sky tells us the story of God. It does. And I want to tell you something. In September, we're going to see that. Because the sky is coming to a place where we're going to see the virgin and we're going to see things lined up on that. And Revelation, you can begin to look at it in Revelation chapter 12. It says certain things and that's going to line up in the sky. We'll talk about that as we get closer to it this year. But I need to tell you that God has planned the story of salvation in the stars. Now think about that for a minute. I remember listening to Bill Prankard. And he told me he went to a place and he preached a sermon. And when he preached a sermon, uh, all of the people said, yes, they want to receive Jesus. And he didn't understand why. But when he was up at the front, he said, this man that I want to tell you about is also God. His name is Jesus. And they all went crazy. And they all came to the Lord. And, and he said afterwards, he said, How, wh what happened? What did I say? And they came to him and they said, we finally know his name. His name, he took him, they took him to a graveyard and there were crosses on the graveyard. They'd never heard the gospel. And so then he looked out, he said, how did you know? And he, they said, they looked at the sky and they knew there was a God, but they didn't know his name. Isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating. Anyway, Psalm 19 verses three to six continue to tell us, there is no speech, not one speech, not one language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through the, whole earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit goes to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, this is fascinating. Again, we look at this Nothing is hidden from God. The sun is always available, only leaving for the night. And did you know that the sun is reflected in the night off the moon? So just so you know, just so you're aware of that, that the moon reflects the sun. And so this is fascinating because God tells us that the sun is always there. The earth rotates, but the sun is always there. We need to recognize that because that's how God speaks and God says that. He says, in fact, I will tell you, there are 85% of the world cannot see the stars at night because of the light pollution. And it's just the way the world is. But let me tell you, back in the day, before there was lights everywhere, you could see what God was doing and you could understand it. And they knew it in the book of Psalms. Now we go on and we learn in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14, the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord, I love this part. The fear of the Lord is clean, 
enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults, O Lord. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Totally dedicated to God. You see, God makes us acceptable in his sight by the word of God. Now, who is the word of God? We must seek the heart of the Lord to truly know and understand what he desires from us. This is very important. So we understand that. Revelation 19 says that the name of the one who comes out of the sky to place judgment on the earth and to make straight his way and to let them know his name is called, look it up for yourself, Revelation chapter 19. His name is called the Word of God. And he's on a white horse. I want to tell you something. I want to be behind him. And so we must remember that Jesus Christ and his personality are in the Bible. Thank you for staying with us as we continue through this particular journey in the Bible. I am excited. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be continuing to talk about Psalms as we focus on the 24th chapter to the 28th. Most people, they figure, well, let's 23rd. That's the way the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. I shall not want. Mm -hmm. But the 24th chapter is amazing and it's beautiful. We'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. Ryan, what's up? Well, last Monday we explored Psalm chapter 2's Messianic prophecies, and today we study Psalm chapter 16. Now, this is an amazing passage of scripture where the Messiah himself is speaking through the psalmist. Let's explore. The Psalms, just like the Law and the Prophets, contain Messianic prophecies. These are prophecies concerning Israel's future Savior, and ultimately the entire world's Savior. Indeed, in Psalm chapter 16, the Messiah himself, through the psalmist, is speaking. He says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, You are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
This psalm, among other things, tells of the unique relationship that the Messiah would have with God. This special relationship is emphasized in the Gospel of John. Verses 10 to 11 reveal also that Messiah would die, but would be raised back to life. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, he says. For one soul not to be left in Sheol, it must first go there. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, he continues. You will show me the path of life. Unlike King David, who died and saw corruption, the Messiah would see no corruption because God would raise him up. So Psalm chapter 16 teaches that the Messiah would have a unique relationship with God, that he would die and would rise again. Now, as I mentioned last week, the book of Psalms, while being an excellent devotional book, is so much more. It's true. The Psalms are really poetic versions of the messages of the law and the prophets. In fact, Psalm 22, which we'll be studying next week, has been called the poetic version of Isaiah chapter 53, that famous chapter about the suffering that the Messiah would have to go through. More next week. You know, that's interesting, Ryan, because there are, there are Psalms that, and it really covers about a thousand years, as you have said, and there are Psalms that cover many different things. And it seems like the hymnal of Israel, the book of Psalms, is exactly that. It covers all of the things. There are Psalms in there that tell us mm -hmm. that, you know, this is what happened. They left Egypt. They went into Egypt when they were a family. They left Egypt as a nation and goes through the whole history of mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. So you have these Psalms that tell the story of exactly what mm -hmm. is happening. Then you have Messianic Psalms mm -hmm. that are talking about God and his salvation and what what is he going to do? It's absolutely such stunning. a rich book. Mm -hmm. It absolutely. really is. It gives us a window into the beliefs and the ideologies of the ancient Israelites during the time period of the kings. And I think that's so interesting. I mean, we even get to see their uh, phraseology, if you mm -hmm. will. We get to see, you know, there are certain phrases that are repeated in mm -hmm. many different Psalms that aren't from the same author. So we get to see kind of the, the, the language of their religious life, of their spiritual life even. Um, so, uh, you know, poetry and, and song lyrics have a really interesting way of opening that window into yeah. the human element of a culture. And, and we see that especially, especially in the historical Psalms uh, um, and even in some of the prophetic Psalms where, you know, they're, they're trying to pass on through music and successfully passing mm -hmm. on. Uh, we see the evidence in the Israelite culture today, Jewish culture today, I should say. Um, of, of them passing on their history through music and through poetry very effectively. And hopefully we pay attention because this is really important today with all of the various ways that uh, people get in contact with each other, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of that. Nobody thinks about really what's important. But the Bible is the most published book. It's the most important book. And God has made it that way. And in many ways, the most inexpensive book. You know, you can get on the internet and get a hold of the Bible very easily. Mm -hmm. And so we need to realize that the word of God, Psalms tells us everything. And if you don't know what to start reading, start reading Psalms. That's a good way to start. So anyway, that's a fascinating study, Ryan. Uh, what did you do today? Well, I was enjoying hearing the conversation here because actually I just wanted, I had jotted down a few ideas of what I collected in my own thoughts and my own meditation with the Lord for Psalm 19. And so I'm just going to briefly read them. Um, the first six verses of Psalm 19 discuss God's revelation through his created world. It starts off, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. So the first six verses talk about God's revelation through his created world. The last eight verses stress his even greater revelation through his written word, because it begins to change into, starting at verse seven, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the last eight verses stress his even greater revelation through his written word. The world of the Lord is imperfect in its bondage to the curse of sin, which condemns the souls of men. When God first created the world, it was perfect. He said it was very good, but because of sin, we were put under 
curse. So the world of the Lord is now imperfect in its bondage to the curse of sin, which condemns the soul of men. But the word of the Lord is perfect, converting our souls. What natural revelation only promises, written revelation accomplishes. What natural revelation only promises, written revelation accomplishes. The final verse, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer is a beautiful prayer that recognizes the necessary relationship between the thoughts of our hearts and the words on our lips. If the word of God is the center of both, then both will be acceptable to the one who will be both redeemer and strong refuge to our souls. What's important here is to recognize that our mouth and what we say has to be aligned with yes, God's with, spirit. With God. <laughs> and it has to come from the heart. It's true. <laughs> That's yep. difficult because, you know, sure is. so many times we're loose with our mouth, you mm -hmm. know, but we need to really, easy. as Christians, sure as people is. who follow God, we need to pay attention. It was David too that prayed, God put a guard over my yeah. mouth. A lot of times yeah. I have to do that as well. So relatable from a man who lived 3,000 years ago. It's, it's I mean, so amazing how we can be like, yes. yes. Yeah. Human totally <laughs> nature Me is too, God. the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, with uh, everything with uh, the Facebook and Twitter and everything, people are talking. Right. Christians are talking. Even a fool is thought to be wise, to be wise when, he when he is silent. silent. <laughs> I've thought of that too wow. many That's times. That's very interesting. <laughs> Proverbs. Wow. Let me tell you that uh, <laughs> we can say a lot of different things and all of us are working on that. But one of the ways that we do that is we find that when we say to the Lord, when we say to God, Lord, be my Lord, there's a lot of people who know God, but they don't know him as Jesus Christ being their Lord. When we say, be my Lord, that means you're Lord of my mouth too. You're Lord of everything I say. And when you take that on, when you say, Lord, I need you to help me, and then you do that, God does help you. Now, I want to pray for the people who are struggling with what they say. Father, in Jesus' name, I understand this struggle more than most. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to get control over what we type and what we say. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.